Good evening. Welcome to the 7th Annual Hot Dog Hall of Fame Ceremony. I'm Tyler Stock, class of 2005, and I'll be your host this evening. I'd like to introduce the president of the Frankfurt Hot Dog Hall of Fame Board of Directors, Don Russ, class of 1964. <laughs> Mayor Judy Sheets. Superintendent of Schools, Matt Boda. And a new face, our new high school principal, Jennifer Miller, class of 1995. The Hall of Fame inducted its first class in 2018. Our distinguished alumni include doctors, lawyers, soldiers, philanthropists, entrepreneurs, athletes, journalists, teachers, and even a rock star. At this time, it's my privilege to ask the newest members of the Hot Dog Hall of Fame to come out and join us. Categories of people. 
they are all they all make us proud to be hot dogs, and they all push us to do more for our community and school. We say this every year, but this is a special place with special people, and we are all blessed to be hot dogs. And if you don't believe me, like I said, stop and read those plaques. You'll be very impressed that the type of people that came out of such a small town and have gone on to do such great things here in abroad. So whether this is the first time you've attended the Hall of Fame ceremony or you've been here every year, I'm going to go over tonight's run of show. I'll give a brief introduction of each of our inductees. There'll be a video that plays, and then each inductee will be given five minutes or so for an acknowledgement speech. At the conclusion, conclusion of each speech, Don and Russ will present the inductee with their Hall of Fame plaque and a photo uh, op will occur. At this time, I'd like to introduce the president of the Hot Dog Hall of Fame Board of Directors, Don Russ, to say a few words. Well, I'd like to thank all of you again for being here, being very supportive of these great people and our whole program. What I would like to do is we have some returning honorees, and I'd like to recognize them. So when I call your name, please stand and stay standing until I get through the list. Janelle Smith, class of 2020. Sarah Ortho, class of 2023. Steve Mullet, class of 2022. Fred Carter, class of 2023. Dr. David Moore, class of 2020. <laughs> Kelly Good, class of 2022. <laughs> Vance Hinton, class of 2018. I thought he was going to be here, I'm not sure. Okay. Please give all of these. <laughs> We have two posthumous inductees to honor tonight. Our first inductee had extraordinary achievements uh, after leaving Frankfurt, uh, after he left Frankfurt to serve in the military. He then came home to make our community a better place as well. He's a man who brought national recognition to Frankfurt while living here most of his life. Kurt Day graduated with the class of 1935. After serving in the 14th Armored Unit in Germany during World War II, he returned to Frankfurt and was introduced to the game of horseshoes, horseshoe pitching. Quickly excelling, Kurt was an 18-time Indiana State champion and was world champion in 1966, 1971, and 1974. Kurt was inducted into the National Horseshoe Pitchers Hall of Fame in 1969. Accepting this award in memory of Kurt Day is his son, Paul Day. Alright, thank you. 
Tom graduated from Butler with a degree in education. After serving in the USAF Strategic Air Command, Tom went to work for the Farmers Bank, where after 36 years, he retired as president and CEO of the bank. Tom was appointed a Sagamore of the Wabash in 2000, accepting a plaque on Tom's behalf as his son, Steve Rohrbaugh.
Although I have no biological children, I feel that I have about 5,000 kids. <laughs> One of my kids became a teaching colleague and then a Franklin High School principal. Right, Cindy Long? Another MCs <coughs> these Hall of Fame festivities. Right, Tyler? We are all hot dogs. Of all the honors that I have received in all of these different areas, I consider this the most meaningful, and I will treasure it forever. Thank you. Gunyon, right here. I am so sorry I can't be there. I can't even tell you how sad I am that I'm not with you. Um, but you're all there and watching me. And at the time you're watching this, I'll be in Washington, D.C. I was like, got the call from Don Stock, and I'm like, hmm, what's Don Stock calling me for? So what an honor this is. Um, I can't even express what an honor it is. And to be inducted the same year as Kurt Day, my dad, oh, if he were alive, would be so proud. Me and Kurt Day at the same time, right? Hi, Day family. So my dad pitched shoes with Kurt Day over at Dorners Park and all around the country, actually. They went to... Um, tournaments and um, they both went to worlds but of course Kurt won the world's champ and my dad was in a different class he didn't shoot quite as many ringers I even shot a few shoes back in my day pitch shoes we should say not shot pitched we pitch shoes so again I'm in the class of 71 we're all here and having fun we're the class of 71 had a great class oh my gosh what a great class we had I'd loved the classmates and you know we were all pretty close um pretty much knew each other although now my memory's like who is that i don't remember that person but um i'm also honored to be inducted um with a honored group of people from over the years especially my sweet first cousin karen mclean miller we grew up together, of course, with the McLeans, my mother being a McLean, so all the McLean family, all seven of uh, Uncle John and Aunt Evelyn's kids, but Karen and I were especially close, and I miss her so much. Um, I went to Southside, Southside Archers, and my life has been um, totally changed because of friends that I met starting in grade school. So Frankfurt was a great place for me to grow up and I can say helped make me who I am, right? I met my best friends for life in grade school at um, Southside Grade School. Still stay in touch. In junior high, I went on to meet two more friends. Hi, Diane um, and Cindy in junior high and Zora. Hi, Zora. 
but Rosie and I started out from kindergarten on, and then we all were in choir together, um, orchestra, band, that was me, band, dance band with my saxophone, marching band with my clarinet, and um, went to contest, we're in choir, swing choir, um, we were geeky. We did all the music stuff, didn't we? Yeah. And then all the great teachers, grade school, junior high, high school. I'm not going to start naming because I'll leave out somebody, but everybody knows who my favorites are. We all know who our favorites are. So what a great influence that had. And then I went off to college to, it was called Indiana Central College, went on to be Indiana Central University, and went on to be University of Indianapolis now. I went with my best friend Rosie Jennings and we went through college together. At some point I went off to be elementary education. Two years into it, Rosie and I both decided we'd switch our majors for whatever reason and I never wanted to be a nurse and I switched to nursing. So I got a two-year nursing degree and then um, started working, took my board, started working at Methodist Hospital, downtown Indianapolis, and um, went back for the next three years and finished up my bachelor's, got my um, master's in counseling. I was going to get it in nursing. I always thought I'd be like the senior vice president in nursing, but I soon learned that I didn't like management. How about that? What I found, I started out in cardiovascular critical care, had my adrenaline flowing fast as a nurse. Um, what an honor to be a nurse. And um, at some point in life, I switched to OB, not by choice, long story, and I fell in love with OB. Became a lactation counselor, a childbirth educator, and all along the way, cardiovascular and OB, I realized that I loved starting a program from the ground up, growing it, and then handing it to someone else. Because, did I mention, I didn't like management. I looked good, hated it, hated it, was dying inside. But what made my blood flow was project management. Now, I don't know that I chose anything in my life. I think God chose, I know God chose everything for me. I never said to myself, someday I'm gonna be an international expert in postpartum and pregnancy, depression and anxiety. But I am, I'm honored, it's a calling, it's beyond an honor to be working with women and their families, helping them get better. In case you all don't know, postpartum depression affects one in five to seven moms, very common, come hear a lecture sometime from me, one in 10 dads. So. We just didn't realize what it was back in my mom's day. We just ignored it. We said she had a nervous breakdown. That's all we knew. We didn't know to call it postpartum depression. So anyway, went off to college, had a great time, um, set up projects, worked at Methodist Hospital for 43 years. But in that, somewhere around 1997, somebody came and said, Bertie, what do we have for postpartum depression? And I said, nothing. I'm the OB nurse with a master's in counseling. Let me look into it. I went to California to take training from Postpartum Support International. And if you read my bio, I now work full-time for Postpartum Support International. I was the first education and training chair on the board of directors, and I was a president. And I continue now to work full-time after retiring from Indiana University Health in 2018. I now work full-time, can't retire, for Postpartum Support International as the director of training and certification. Uh, I still love working in this field. I still love helping women and their families get better, and I love doing trainings to train other professionals. So along the way, what God had planned for me was to do this. I get to travel. I've traveled all over the world and teach other professionals. I have taught Thailand virtually, China virtually, in person in China and Shanghai twice, southern France three times, and um, I'm going this fall to Barcelona. As long as I can still travel, I'm still gonna do it. So 
I couldn't be more honored again. I'm so sorry I'm not there with you. Thank you for this amazing honor. You all have fun and please party in my name and think about me um, today and tonight and I'll be watching hopefully live stream. So thank you again. Accepting on behalf of Bernie Gendon Myers, Hall of Fame board member Cindy Long. This admiration for our next inductee. Um, I spoke to her beforehand as a Riley family myself. I know I do. Um, so, especially if you have children, uh, she's a valued member of the medical community. An alumnus of the class of 1997, jo Dr. Jody Skiles is a graduate of Indiana University School of Medicine and is presently serves as a pediatric hematologist and oncologist at the Riley Hospital for Children. Jody's main focus is in stem cell transplant and immune-based therapies. Among her other honors, she is a recipient of the Riley Hospital for Children Red Shoes Award. Ladies and gentlemen, Dr. Jody Skiles.
If I had to say what is the next kind of stepping stone for me, it would have to be all the educators that really contributed. And I, there are so many names that I could mention right now, and I wish I could list them all, but I'll just name a few standouts. Um, Mrs. Moore was my kindergarten teacher, and that is really where I decided that I wanted to pursue medicine. Mrs. Moore hosted career day, parent career day. She invited in parents to come talk about what they do in their careers. And in hindsight, I think it was probably a surgical scrub tech that came in. But I was so inspired that this person <laughs> came in, like dressed in all their garb, and you know, then talking about their career and talking about how they wanted to help people. And I thought, I want to help people. That sounds that sounds so cool. And from that day forward, I said, you know what, I want to be a doctor. And I think what was so unique about that was my parents never told me, and nobody ever told me that I couldn't. Um, you know, that was early enough that like women in medicine wasn't really a thing at that time. And so, you know, that that culture kind of grew up with me. Um, and with amazing cheerleaders along the way, and parents that told me that they would support me and cheer for me, um, is just such a blessing. So that's where the dream began. Um, when I was in second grade, my second grade teacher was Mrs. Wilson. She's not here tonight, but she was here earlier today. And she was probably the first teacher that I had that made me realize that that there were people outside of my family that loved me, that were cheering for me. And there were so many, so many teachers like that along the way. Um, and then I'll skip ahead, so many middle school teachers that were such an inspiration. But um, in high school, Mr. Ball, who I think is here, but I don't see him. Uh, there you are. Mr. Ball, oh my gosh, I, Mr. Ball was my captain's teacher in high school, and this was in a time when like STEM wasn't a thing, and certainly women in STEM wasn't a thing, and Mr. Ball believed in us, and there was a whole group of us that just, you know, calculus is hard. I don't know how many of you went, to, went through calculus class, but many people would say it wasn't their favorite part, but you know what, Mr. Ball's calculus class and Mr. B's chemistry class are some of my best memories of high school academics, and to have teachers that believed that I could do it was so incredible. So thank you so much for that gift. Um, so from that point forward, you know, when I was later on in high school, one of my best friends, Mona Coburn, passed away, and that was a really challenging time for me. Um, and I think it was probably my first lesson in like serious humility of not being able to just like muscle through it and not being able to just coming to, to the end of myself um, and having a community of people, including, as Bertie mentioned, um, Karen Miller, Karen McLean Miller was a huge instrumental piece of helping me find Jesus and being involved in the church in my life. And that changed not just my life, but the life of my entire family moving forward. And I'm so thankful for that gift. Um, and that. I think that's what taught me that like my life is not about me. It's about so much more than me and the way that we connect and reach to other people. Um, and that lesson was just one of the first of many lessons in humility. Um, going through college and medical school and residency and fellowship, it is a constant daily battle of humble pie, if I'm being completely honest. Learning that um, it's okay to not know something and to be um, vulnerable enough to say, I don't understand and I need you to help me. And you know, really truly having an amazing history of educators that believed in me and poured into me and helped me understand and taught me the, the art of medicine um, is such a blessing um, that I can't begin to describe how, what a gift that is um, and the layers of humility that have come with that. Um, I think the next lesson in humility for me was I, those of you who walked with me through all of those years of training will also tell you that I bemoaned my singleness. I was, I wanted to be a mom and I wanted to get married and I wanted to have kids. And I really was worried that it wasn't gonna happen because I was so focused on academics. And in my final year of training, I met my husband right at the end of my training when I had kind of just said, you know, God, even if, you don't have the plan for me that I think I have for me, it's gonna be okay. And I kind of just said, I'm just gonna to have to accept that it's not gonna happen. And it was literally the very next week I met my husband. Um, he, I remember him saying to me, I'm sorry, can you tell me how many years of school you've done again? I don't understand all of these years. He's like, what grade are you in? And I said, I had that all up, I said, honey, I'm in the 27th grade. <laughs> um, and he was like, that I can understand. 
understand. Um, and I, just a huge shout out to my husband, Phil. Those of you that don't know him, gosh, everybody needs a Phil in your life. Um, he has been such an amazing support for me. Um, he loves me unconditionally. He, the only way that I'm able to do what I'm able to do on the work front is because he supported me on the home front. Um, he picks up roles that most husbands would never think of and um, shares the load with, with raising our two amazing girls in a way that is so graceful and so lovely, and I could never thank him for that. So I hope all of you have a fill in your life. Um, and then probably the last two stepping stones for me, um, right toward the end of my training, how many of you had the experience of being volunteered something? <laughs> something you didn't necessarily dream for yourself, but somebody had a plan for you. I was volunteered sort of, that I needed to go to Kenya and run a pediatric cancer program in Kenya. And at the time, I was in my next to last year of training, and I had literally a list as long as my arm of reasons why there was no way that I could do that. Um, because it wasn't just pediatric oncology, it was also adult oncology. And while I had done training in internal medicine as part of my residency, I didn't have any training in breast cancer and colon cancer and pancreatic cancer. Like, those are foreign languages to me. And they said, no, 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 it'll be okay. It'll be okay. Like, it's not that hard. You can't, it can't be worse than what it is because there isn't a program right now. So anything that you can contribute will be helpful. Very reluctantly, um, I eventually said yes. And what I learned from that experience is that um, God does, does not call the equipped, he equips the call. And even when you have to be called the <laughs> Um, I went to Kenya, and I think what I learned there, there's so many lessons that I could talk about from my time in Kenya. I ran the program there for about five years, um, and I think probably the single biggest thing that I learned there is that he is God and I am not. Um, I will do all the things. I will try my hardest. I will um, see the patients. I will provide access to medicines, but at the end of the day, I don't control the outcome. I will care for you. I will love you, but I don't control and that is a really hard lesson to learn when what you've been taught your whole life is that your job is to heal people and cure people. And when you can't, it is, it is a sucker punch to the gut, honestly. Um, and, and being able to accept that and know that um, even in the moments where there have to be transitions and goals of care, and those really hard conversations, like the fact that I get the honor of still walking the those families is still one of the greatest pleasures of my life. I love my job. Um, I feel so bad for people who don't love their jobs because I just can't fathom a life of spending all that amount of time doing something we don't absolutely love. And it really is such an honor, which brings me to my final stepping stone, which is um, my current role. I'm the medical director of the adult and pediatric transplant programs at IU and Miami Hospital. And in those roles, there are good and bad. Just like with anything there, good and bad, and probably the single biggest good is for sure the patients. I love the time that I get to spend with patients and doing clinical care, um, to get to come along families in their time of greatest crisis, to be the person that nobody wants to meet. Um, you know, nobody wants to meet a pediatric oncologist. And, and so getting to like come alongside those families, and I always promise my, my patients, you know, I'm, I, the patients that I deal with are the patients who have failed everything else, right? They fail traditional therapies and then they need sort of something novel and innovative. And so I always tell families when I meet them, I know you don't want to know me, but I promise by the time this is done, I will feel like an extension of your family. And because that's something that I would want my kids treated if my kids had a need like that. And it is such a delight um, and such a privilege to learn from my families. There's nothing quite like um, the perspective that you gain when you watch somebody go away through something like that, um, of how not to sweat the small stuff. I'm not saying I'm perfect at it, I definitely still sweat small stuff all the time. But I, I hope that I do a better job because of the experience of my patients and families. Um, the other really cool part of my job is the science. Oh my gosh, you guys, I could spend days up here talking to you about how cool the science is of what we're doing right now and how probably one day, not too far in the distant future, we're going to look back and say, I'm sorry, you did what? You gave poison to patients to cure, cure them? That's crazy, right? Like, just like some of the things that happened hundreds of years ago, that we look back now and say, that was crazy what they did. And I'm sure that that will also be true in our future because of the science that is coming along right now. And that to get to be on the front lines of that and witness it is just such an honor. Um, and I have 
the most amazing team of people surrounding me, and this work would not be possible without all of those people. It truly does take a village. Um, there are bad parts too. Like I mentioned before, there are moments when we do have to transition to health care. Thankfully, it's not that often. It's not nearly as often as it is in the adult world. But um, having to have that conversation with the family is gut-wrenching, um, but still an honor and a privilege to get to be there in those moments. Um, and hopefully, we're going really to be able to point them to them with Jesus if we have that opportunity. So I'm so thankful, again, for this privilege of being here, for all of the shoulders of giants that are standing on the head down before me. Thank you so much. Thank you to the committee for um, nominating me, for particularly Representative Kippy for tonight for her nomination. Thank you so much. Okay, before we continue on with our honorees, uh, I just want to take a moment here to remind everyone that we can't honor the achievements of hot dogs uh, hot dog alumni unless we do the work of nominating them. To tell you how you can do that, here's the Frankfurt Community School Superintendent and Hot Dog Hall of Fame board member, Dr. Matt Rodin. Thank you, Tyler. And I just, as I'm sitting here listening, and we're not all the way through yet, but just what a blessing to hear the achievements of all of the Hall of Fame inductees, and more importantly, to hear the stories of the successes of how you got to where you are now and how you're serving in your current positions. Kids will, kids in high school now, as well as kids in the hot dogs in the future, will be able to see your stories, and that will inspire them to do what you do. And, and to know the steps, as far as stepping stones of how to get there. So thank you for paving the way for them. This isn't possible. We, we, the Hall of Fame committee relies on nomination forms in order to nominate the great Hall of Fame inductees that we get each year. You can do that by going to frankfurtschools.org. And there are nomination forms there under the uh, Frankfurt Education Foundation to nominate. Thank you to all the golfers who came out yesterday at the fourth annual golf outing. We thank you for your donations. Those donations go to help programs and students at the community schools of Frankfurt. And we thank you to all of our sponsors. You will see those listed in your programs. We hope that you support those sponsors, and a lot of this is not possible without those sponsors. So we thank you to those sponsors. And the last thing is, go hot dogs. All right. ladies. After graduating with the class of 1979, Michelle Miller Gillian. 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 I knew I could mess it up. I practiced about 50 times for the Michelle Miller Gillian earned a degree in art history from Hiram College and received her master's degree in library and information science from Kent State University. Michelle is currently the Director of Collections and Research at the National First Ladies Library and Museum in Canton, Ohio. Please welcome Michelle Miller. Thank you. I want to thank um, the uh, Hot Dog Hall of Fame board so much for this honor. I'm still just kind of feeling it's surreal. Um, I uh, have to thank, also thank Tom Piercy, who nominated me. Um, he and I were in um, high school or middle school. We were um, partners in science class um, by uh, alphabetical order, and we were together, Miller and Piercy. There was no in or out between us. And, um, we just laughed the entire time, and we had such a good time, and he was always remained a good friend of mine, and we reconnected a couple of years ago, and um, we realized that our career paths had passed, and were very, very parallel, 
And um, I'm so honored, mainly, that he uh, thought enough of what I do to nominate me. So thank you, Tom, even though he's not you. Um, I have to thank, first and foremost, my family. Um, Dwayne and Connie Miller over there. Thank you so much for making me. <laughs> More important, thank you for giving me amazing brother and sister, Douglas Dwayne Miller and Megan Davis, or Megan Miller Davis, and their amazing families, my um, amazing nieces and nephews, and grand nieces and nephews are here too. And um, I'm just so, I cherish all of you. And last but not least, I have to thank my three sons, Zach, Seth, and Jess, for being here. Um, it's such an honor to be your mom. I love you more than life itself. And it's such a privilege to get to see you guys walk your own path through this life and get to root you on. So thanks for being here for me. Um, there are really two people that I wanted to thank. Um, I had such wonderful memories here at Frankfurt, but I have to thank two people who were super, super, super important in really changing my life. And the first one uh, uh, was uh, from first grade in Southside Elementary School in Mrs. Igney's class. Um, her name is Karen Clausen Cunningham. Karen, where are you? I know you're here. There she is. And um, she uh, walked, she, I met her in the first grade, and I loved her. She was just this little tiny thing. She had big blonde hair, big blue eyes, and she was so kind funny and she was um, but the most important thing that I thought was so cool about her was she did not suffer bullies and she would get in front of someone who was being bullied and tell them to just cut it out right now and she would um, uh, and then she would go to the person who was being bullied and say don't pay any attention to them and I thought she was really cool and one day I was on the, the um, witch's hat and she climbed aboard and she sat next to me and we sat and talked the entire rest of the recess it was just so deep. It was wonderful. And um, when we got off of the witch's hat, she grabbed my hand, and we walked back in the school, hand in hand, and we didn't let go until we got into, back into the room. And um, she's been there for me on and off uh, through all these years. Um, there were times when we wouldn't even see each other or talk for years. And then we would just call each other up and be like, just no time had gone by. So. Um, thank you, Karen, so much for being there for me. And last but not least, I have to thank um, someone um, who is in the, um, a teacher uh, here at the Tibet uh, Frankfurt School System. Um, I had amazing school teachers here. And I had a wonderful education here that I just took for granted until I actually left Frankfurt, left the state of Indiana, lived in several other places, and raised my own sons to realize how exceptional my education had been here in the Frankfurt public school system. And I had amazing teachers. Um, but there was one who I must thank, who I would not be standing here today without him. That's Martin L. Henderson. Um, he took a chance on me um, after I'd had a class with him in, the, in my sophomore year. And he invited me to be at the Red Barn Summer Theater. It was the first of three summers that I spent there, and they were the best summers of my life. And I learned a lot about myself and who I might just be. And, um, and he, that would have been enough, right, I think. But he went above and beyond. He, um, when I was thinking about going to college, he actually, uh, I asked him about it. And I said, you know, can I go to college? Where should I go? And he gave, me, he gave me all these wonderful ideas. And he said, it'll help you. And after a little bit of time, he, um, I came to him with a little list that I had of where I might go to college. And he took that list. And then he, he caught back to me and he said, there is a, a scholarship, full ride scholarship to Ball State University. But you have to audition for it. And so, I did. I, I did that, and I actually had to audition in front of him 
And believe me, if you could audition in front of Martin Henderson, yeah. uh, you could do anything. It was, it was no big deal. So um, I actually, all I got from it is well done after he only auditioned for him. And so I went out um, on that stage at uh, Ball State, and I knew that I made my very best, and I won. And um, it was a fabulous, fabulous year that I had, and I liked every minute of it at Ball State University. Um, it led me on to what I eventually came to do, uh, as I do now, as a um, as an archivist and uh, curator at the National First Ladies Library. Um, I am so honored uh, that I get to uh, to look at artifacts and and things that people actually wore, actually wrote. Um, I get to really look at that person who is no longer here. Uh, but they left their mark on, 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 on their life and on our lives. And I find that so important to remember. The history is so important to honor others and have a sense of where you've come from. Um, and then the other part that I do is I do a lot of uh, exhibitions. And when I do those exhibitions, um, I use all those, those things that I learned um, through Martin Henderson. Uh, what story are you going to tell? Uh, am I going to tell this story about this first lady? What artifact will I use? Will I use a dress? Will I use a gloves? What will I use to tell that story about her? How do I tell that story? How do I engage the audience into getting interested in through this object? I also am concerned about the backdrop. What's the backdrop look like? What's my lighting? I use all those things that I learned from Martin Henderson at the Red Barn Summer Theater in my job every day, and it gives me such joy. Um, and uh, I'm so honored again to be here today. Thank you so very much. Here's the first of two outstanding Kellys, Mr. Michael Kelly. Eric hardly ever acknowledged that I was in the building. 
<laughs> and Aaron hardly ever acknowledged that I wasn't in the building. <laughs> Rarely saw them in, in, in the school, though, and actually never for discipline. I let Mr. Melon take care of any discipline, <laughs> which was none. As you saw in, or you're seeing probably in some of these videos, the pictures that were related to my family or Frankfurt High School. Allow me to share a personal history of my relationship with Frankfurt School. Being in the class of 1966 provided my class with some unique opportunities. As a baby boomers, we were part of a large post-war children population requiring larger schools. Wisely, the powers of be in this community began building the building that we're in today. However, it was not completed in time to, to accommodate that enrollment bulge that was on the way. So the class of 1966 was provided some unique opportunities. By the way, also one of my teachers is sitting here, Mrs. Meyer, thank you for the English that you gave me. I hope you don't critique this speech too poorly. <laughs> the class of 66 was one of the last two classes to attend the seventh grade elementary in this school corporation. The class of 66 was the last class to attend the downtown Frankfurt High School as eighth graders. The class of 66 was the first to attend Frankfurt Junior High School as a, as a, as a ninth grader. The class of 66 was the only class I knew of that was split in half in one half in two groups. One group starting in the day in downtown building, the other day starting at Tiger Elementary School. By the way, no busing. The five or six restaurants between the high school and the Tiger loved it. <laughs> I believe the class of 66 was the first class to graduate from this building and it being completed. I was away from Franklin High School for four years to complete a BA in education at Purdue and hired then as a special education teacher in this building. I know it, I mean, I'm sorry, the downtown building then. Being drafted after five months of teaching, the Selective Service took me away from Frankfurt Schools for a role as a counselor in the U.S. Army and an all expense paid trip to Vietnam. <laughs> after two years of military obligation was completed, I returned to Frankfurt High School as a special education teacher. When I retired in 2015, I held, had held positions of teacher, coach, alternative education director, technology director, FHS assistant principal and finally finished my career as a Frankfurt Middle School principal. And, and yes, you still see me in the building at times. I'm on the building trades board and meeting them with the students sometimes because I do still coach golf. I congratulate Bertie, Michelle, Jody, and Travis for their recognition of their accomplishments and their well-deserved honor. I must add that Travis and I are not related, but his parents, the late Bill and Barbara Kelly, close friends, surely are celebrating your little for us. It's quite an accomplishment to convert my good friend and golf partner from Place City Eel to a Frankfurt hot dog. <laughs> We've been in this building a long time together. Too. Over the past 60 years, this building has been my second home. The number of hours I spend here is inconceivable. Mm -hmm. The number of personal relationships with staff and students is unforgettable. Thank you, Ranger community, for believing in me.
graduating with a degree in aviation technology. He entered the Marine Corps as a second lieutenant and graduated first in his flight school class. Travis flew over 150 combat missions in Iraq and Afghanistan, earning seven air medals in the Navy uh, Combination Medal of Valor. Travis retired from the Marines as a Lieutenant Colonel. It is an honor to introduce a member of the Frankfurt High School class of 1991, Mr. Travis Kelly. behind them and of course I was I won the lottery for that you know I had two awesome grandparents I had two uh, incredible parents most of you know Barbara Bill Kelly um, I couldn't have asked for anything more to start out life uh, from uh, you know a, 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 an incredible uh, elevated start um, I have a great an awesome brother uh, his uh, wife Keisha sister-in-law and then of course my military successes uh, I wouldn't have had any of them without Jennifer. Uh, you guys that know her, she's a beautiful person inside and out. I was truly lucky to have her along the way. We have two awesome kids, Ryan and Claire. Uh, it's been probably the joy of my life to see them grow and imagine what they're going to go do uh, here in the very near future. It's really an awesome thing to witness and, and to watch. Um, when I think about my time at Frankfurt and what it means to me, what it meant to me at this high school and being part of this community, it really it created an incredible foundation for which you could always you could you could always fall back on. And that foundation gave you the courage to take chances, take risks. You're gonna hear me say that a few times. It gave me the courage to do that and not worry so much about failure because I always knew that I had people back home that had my back and were thinking of me. Um, throughout all my deployments, when I went off to college, I was always getting well wishes, getting care packages, getting letters, getting emails from many of you in this room. And uh, that sense of community, that sense of foundation is really what gave me the possibility of, of ever having any kind of success in life. I had multiple parents, really. Uh, you know, I see Ken and Sandy Myers. I was lucky. That's <laughs> real um, the, the Neal family, uh, Gary and Sarah, Tom and Barbara went out there. I mean, they became second families to me. I spent almost as much time in your house as I did my house. And, uh, and that, that matters in life. Having that to fall back on, it matters. It's important. Those relationships give you the, the foundation, the basis that you need. I can tell you lots of times, I thought, well, what would Sandy Meyer think? Okay, what would, you know, well, if I, if I have to explain this to Gary Neal, what is he going to say? Um, and those things, those things matter. They help you through life, and they help you through the hard times and the struggles. So this community, it, um, it gave a lot to me. Um, and even now, it continues to give me with, uh, with this honor. So I'm, I'm truly thankful. I'm very, very thankful to, uh, to have this community and have this honor. Um, and, and again, I, it's going to be hard for me to repay that. When I left the Marine Corps, I said, that, you know, I got more from the Marine Corps that I could ever repay, um, and, and really, I got more from this community that I, that I could ever repay, so thank you from the bottom of my heart. I'm glad to see there are some young people here. I was hoping it wouldn't be all older people, that, but uh, and so we do have some young people here, and I'd like to offer just a couple things, really two things. Um, my daughter and I just flew up to Oshkosh, and we, we flew our T-28 up there, and we got to watch you know, the biggest air show really in the world. And as we were watching the fighters do their demonstrations, the F-35, the F-22, um, it really, I sat there and I, I, I teared up. It was hard for me to watch. Um, kind of painful because I missed it so much. And to have, <clears throat> to have that kind of joy um, at work, uh, it, was, it was already said. 
Um, to have that kind of joy at work is a, is a life-changing event. And to see, see those, uh, the pilots, you know, come across Joe Center at 600 knots, and you know they're getting ready to go into that 8G turn, and I found myself literally tensing my thigh muscles, tensing my butt muscles, <laughs> tensing my core, pushing the blood up in my head, because I knew the vision was going to come down, and literally sitting there doing this anti-G straining maneuver, because it just took me right back to that. Um, and every time I see a jet perform, max perform, a fighter plane, I, it takes me there. So what I'm saying is that it, it was something that I loved, I mean truly loved, and you can't help but be successful when you have something you love like that. It's easy. I, I didn't work. I didn't, I'm a lazy person. I didn't work. Um, I didn't do anything exceptional. I didn't uh, try exceptionally hard. I loved flying fighters. And when you love that, you're going to be good at it just by, by love. I mean, just by nature, you're going to be good when you love something like that. Everybody up here, they love what they, what they do, what they did, and therefore they were superb at it. That's, that's kind of one of the messages I want to tell the young folks there. Find something you love. If you can't, it's hard. It's hard to find, and it might take you a long time. But find that thing that you love and don't let it go. You know, you're going to feel this fire in your belly, the spirit of adventure that you want to go try and do something. Fan the flame, put a little gas on it, let it go, and see where it takes you. And that brings me up to the, the kind of the second point. And it's really about taking risks. Um, the F-18, every fight, every airplane has an envelope. And you've probably heard the term, we're at the edge of the envelope, we're pushing the edge of the envelope. I've heard that in staff meetings. <laughs> it has nothing to do with aviation. It's a business staff meeting, and they're using that terminology. It's correct, but I don't think they know what it actually is. And, the envelope in an airplane is, is basically a diagram of, of how it performs. And the F-18 in a fighter airplane, it's a huge envelope. On the x-axis, you have speed all the way from like 45 knots, where it's falling out of the sky, to 1.6 Mach, 1,200 miles an hour, where things are ripping off the plane. Um, on the vertical axis, the y-axis, you have your turn rate, which a fighter plane is all about how fast it can turn, how well it can turn. And then it's basically it defines those parameters through a load, a G limit on the right hand side, the most G's you can pull. And that's the most G's that your body can pull or the jet, and they happen to kind of coincide. And then on the other side of that graph is uh, the lift limit, uh, which is basically how much lift the wing can produce. So, anyway, what am I saying? It's hard with that picture, but you've got this big envelope. And when you're flying on those edges of the envelope, a well flown fighter is always on the edge of those envelopes. You're at the edge of failure. When you, and the problem with being at the edge of failure, you take just a tiny step over and you're failing, right? Okay? So, what do you do? You neutralize the controls, you get yourself back in control, and then you get back into the fight. And, you know, it got me thinking about the plane that I currently fly is this giant airliner. And it has an envelope too. And it's a much smaller envelope, but even that, that envelope that it has, I only get to fly in a tiny little box inside that envelope. If I go outside of that, I'm getting a call from probably management and ask, hey, not, how about you not fly our airplanes anymore? And <laughs> it's because it's really safe. The center of that envelope is very, very safe, risk-free almost, whereas the outside of that envelope in a fighter is it's dangerous. It, it's, it's dangerous. It's risky. It's fun. It's really fun. <laughs> it's the most exhilarating thing I've ever known. And again, that staying in that little box inside that big airliner, it's, it's a great job. It's not as fun. It's not as fun. So what I'm telling you, especially the young folks, but it really applies to anybody, I would encourage you to get out and touch the outsides of your envelope. You know, take a chance when you're, you know, what does that mean? It's like, well, okay, can I, can I start my own business? Is that business gonna fail? Take a chance and try it, you know? Um, can, I, can I go on this crazy vacation to Malta? Uh, take a chance and try it, you know? Um, can I? Can I, can I get into this college that, you know, this Ivy League school that I don't think I have good enough grades or, uh, you know, take the chance and try. The worst thing that can happen is you fail. And so as long as you're taking this, this risk, and I want to say risk, as long as they don't put you in the ground, the risk that you're taking, they don't put you in the ground, they don't put you in jail, and they don't hurt people that you love, it's okay to take risks and it's okay to fail. So that's really kind of what I, I wanted to, the message I wanted to get out to the young folks. And I still use that myself. Hey, I'm, I'm, I'm too comfortable right now. I need to push myself outside of my comfort zone and, and make myself do something that's different and special. Because that's where all the juice is. That's where all the fun stuff is. It's out there kind of on the outside edge of that stuff. Um, 
with that, I'll cut it. I'm done. I don't want to spend too much time, but I'm, again, truly honored and humbled. Um, this community has meant a great deal to me, and like I said, it's supported me throughout my life and, and even now uh, to this day, um, and I'm very grateful for it, so, so thank you. Thanks again.